Hello, good morning, Art Spread supporters. Good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. I'm Nadine Saeed, co-founder of the Art Spread, and with me is Rowan Ida Diaz. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm also the co-founder of the Art Spread and creative director. Um, today, we're actually going to paint with purple as we talk about our event. We've got this brain template from last month's event that you can print out and paint along with us. Um, or just grab some purple, wear some purple, and <laughs> represent Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. So as you all may know, this is Brain Awareness and Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Uh, what we're here to do today, I know you guys are giving up your Saturday to spend an hour with us, and we can't thank you enough. What we're doing today is recognizing that awareness. So before we get started, just some housekeeping rules. Um, this event will be recorded. Um, if you're speaking on this event, try to speak slow just so our captions can keep up with our pace. I know when I'm nervous, I speak a million miles per hour, but we'll try to keep that contained today. At least I'll do my best to. It's also, um, brain awareness and Alzheimer's event is important. Why? So for the millions of people worldwide, 50 million of us have some sort of brain condition and Alzheimer's. So what does that mean specifically for us? Um, the way it relates to me and why this event is so important is my grandmother had Alzheimer's. She died in 2018 and she really suffered at the last years of her life. I mean, it was really unfortunate that she couldn't remember things like walking miles to pick me up from elementary school every day, coming home to cook the best Middle Eastern food. Um, and I wish that there had been some sort of medication or therapy so that she could have improved and really enjoyed the last years of her life. So that's why we're, at least for me, that's why this event is so important. It, an interesting fact, in the United States, two-thirds of those with Alzheimer's are women. And so I'd like to study that more and figure out why so that I don't have Alzheimer's just like my grandma unfortunately did. Um, I'd also like to say happy Juneteenth. It's a great day today. It's a beautiful day in California. So again, thank you so much for being here with us. And with that, I'd like to pass it to Rowan who will talk about the impact of brain conditions, specifically with art. So today we're going to talk about a couple of different artists. We have iconic artist Wilm de Cooney and contemporary artist with us, Lindsay Holcomb. So we'll get into what Willem de Kooning and how his work evolved as his brain evolved. So if you look here on our event graphic, this is actually um, one of his paintings here. And you can see that this is, uh, for iconic uh, artists, very different from what we usually see in our history books. Um, he was born in 1904 in the Netherlands, and he had a big personality big goals and dreams. Um, he followed his dreams and came to America in 1927 to chase the American dream. He moved to New York and actually became what we call the father of abstract expressionism. In the late 40s to 50s, he began putting his art career um, as a full-time thing. So he started with painting residences and then painting commercial and murals to putting in all of his effort into becoming an artist full time. He met people like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're also iconic artists. Um, and together they formed what is called abstract expressionism. So this movement is a huge deal for artists like myself especially because it's a movement where you're taking away the subject in the foreground and the background. And now you can just express yourself with shape, color, light, texture, forms, and it's not just representational art. Um, so that wasn't really done or considered popular at the time. So that's what makes him so influential. And his art evolved a lot throughout the years. He liked to change styles um, but one of the conversations is that Alzheimer's may have affected his artwork. So in his late works, um, there's actually a collection called Late Paintings. 
um, his style changed a lot to where it was even simpler form than this. So sometimes this would be the subtracted. Um, maybe it was just monochromatic. Sometimes it was just swooping um, movements. And it was very different from what he had produced before. In his 80s, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And this is where some scientists talk about how did Alzheimer's affect his work, if it affected his work. And some believe that it did. They believe that the patterns of his brush strokes changed because his brain changed. And this can be explained through what's called fractal dimensions. So it's very interesting. Um, it's mathematical, but it definitely ties into art. Um, fractals are repeating patterns that change at different scales. So you have the same line repeating, but just getting larger and larger or smaller and smaller. And they noticed that his fractal dimension patterns were changing as, his, as he was aging. So um, they connected that with his brain changes. So some psychologists believe that we can, oh, let me let this, let Rihanna in. Um, so some psychologists believe that, um, you know, this has something to do with Alzheimer's and art, that we can find um, things that, in, it, that can connect science with art and that we can learn from someone's um, early onset of Alzheimer's from their brush strokes. Other scientists believe that, that none of that is true, none of it's connected. And there's actually this book, really awesome book. It's called Essentials of the Brain. It's very simple to read and very clear. And it says that Alzheimer's can alter, um, you know, our physical capabilities and language. So again, those scientists and psychologists are thinking, well, maybe his language with art has changed because of this. Um, and so that's, that's one point of view that's been made. And it's definitely been controversial, but a, a huge topic in the art and science world. Another argument is that his later works um, hold no value. So some people like myself, I really appreciate his later works. They're much simpler. They just go back to the basics. I think that they're brilliant. And so there's some that agree with that. And then there's other critics that feel like if his name wasn't attached to these late paintings, they would hold no value versus the eight to ten million dollars that they do hold now. Um, so regardless of style and preference, say Kooning made a huge impact in the art world, especially for artists like myself. You know, now we can, we're accepted more into the abstract world where we're not just expected to paint in representational styles. And you can find more resources on de Kooning and other um, topics that we talk about with Alzheimer's in the blog post that Nadine will share about later this week for the event recap. Thank you so much for that, Ruan. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker. Um, our first guest speaker is an entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a wife, a new mother, a caregiver, and our first guest speaker, not only in my eyes is she a superhuman, in high school, when I had no friends in the beginning, she let me tag along with her and never kicked me out of her big group of friends. So without further ado, Farah Hannah Hall, please take the floor. She's going to talk about her experience with MX. Hello. So like my, like Danny said, my name is Farah Hall. Um, I was diagnosed with MS July of 2016. Um, it was a late evening. I was getting out of my car and I felt a pop on my lower back and just everything went numb from the waist down. Um, I was at a cousin's house, so I didn't want to freak out right then and there. I just figured maybe it's a pinched nerve. You know, I'll see how I feel tomorrow. Um, the next morning, I still had the numbness in the waist down. So, of course, I went to the hospital. Um, after a few days of testing with uh, blood work, MRIs, a spinal tap, I found out that I have MS. The, of course, my initial reaction is, oh crap, what's my life going to be like now? Um, I actually have an uncle who has MS who lives in Germany, and he is fully disabled. He's in a nursing home. Um, 
he needs 24 hour care. And unfortunately that became my frame of reference of what my life was gonna be like. It was a very scary, stressful, depressing time um, that I just had to go through. A month after my initial relapse, so in August of 2016, I had a second relapse. And this one was a lot worse. I uh, lost all function in the left side of my body. So my, I looked kind of like a stroke victim. My left side of my face wasn't working. Um, so I would only be able to talk on the right side. And then I couldn't use my left arm. I wasn't able to walk. And of course I went straight back to the hospital. Uh, we went to the original hospital that diagnosed me, which I won't mention who they are just to save some face. But when we were there, they had a very slow, uh, They were, there was a lack of urgency in trying to figure out a uh, proper protocol or recovery uh, for me. And luckily I have very involved, some would say intrusive parents that uh, went ahead and had me discharged from that hospital and transferred me over to uh, Scripps in La Jolla, which is a godsend. Uh, the moment I arrived at Scripps, they took a very aggressive approach with my recovery. Um, and I actually got something called a plasma transfer. Within, I was supposed to, I was scheduled to have five transfers. Within the first one, I finally started getting function back into my um, left hand. So imagine a week of just not being able to use one side of your body and then finally getting some sort of control. It felt like it was just a miracle. Um, I knew now that I had some control back that it was just going to be a long road of therapy, but eventually I would, I'd go back to feeling what I'd say is normal. Um, <clears throat> the physical toll that MS had on me, although it was very stressful, it was only for a moment. I think the emotional and mental distress that comes with being diagnosed with something like this is definitely um, the more overwhelming part. Um, you know, it's been five years since I've been diagnosed and I finally feel like I have a grasp of the, um, of the illness and I, excuse me. I feel like I live a relatively normal life now. Um, I definitely feel like MS is just a part of my life rather than the actual whole thing. And yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. That's so powerful. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're on, you know, a path towards what you call normalcy. I do have some questions. Um, so it's been about five years since you uh, since you've been diagnosed. Have you found that you know, your relapses are caused by specific things. And when you do have relapses, how do you help manage them so that it happens less and less intensely? Yeah. Um, well, there are definitely factors that uh, come into play with ca like causing relapses. When I found out I was a, a smoker, a cigarette smoker, and the, the first thing the doctor told me is that if I continue to smoke cigarettes, that that is going to cause more frequent relapses and they are gonna be more aggressive. So that was the first thing I did was I quit smoking. Um, then diet and alcohol has a major um, role in it. I cut back on red meat, on cheese, on alcohol, and I just introduced more uh, leafy greens and just healthier um, foods into my body. Um, I also started working out more aggressively I mean, it's, I had to go through the therapy portion, but once I regained that control, I would go back and like lift weights and just do some cardio. I felt like I, that was a huge factor as to what um, helped me get my, my body back. Um, also stress, I can't stress this enough, but uh, stress is a huge factor. Um, I think that part of the reason I had my second relapse was because I lost my cousin had passed away during that time. And so that was a very depressing, mm -hmm. stressful time for me. And I believe that played a big role in it. That makes a lot of sense. And I've got another question before we can open this up to others. Um, 
obviously you've recently had a baby, so major congratulations. Thank you. How did pregnancy affect having MS? Was there, you know, any ties to that? Well, when I first was diagnosed, the first thing I thought, of course, was can I have kids? Will it get passed down? And fortunately, it doesn't affect um, the ability to get pregnant and it actually is not hereditary. So I don't have to worry that it's going to get passed down to my son. Um, I, oddly enough though, when you are pregnant, your body tends to actually get into this like protective mode and you're, uh, it's very rare for a pregnant woman in her second and third trimester to have any relapses. So mm -hmm. I was, I didn't have to take any medications and I was just mm -hmm. kind of protected, you That's know, amazing. by the baby. Yeah. That's just, amazing. Yeah, go ahead. Just one follow-up question, Farrah. Did anyone tell you what caused it? MS? No, I mean, there. I have a vitamin D deficiency. I wasn't told like that any particular thing caused it. Um, oddly enough, I kind of always felt like I knew I was going to end up having it just because uh, a couple years prior to even the diagnosis, I had very minor um, flare-ups that I thought were other things. Like if I was get, if I'd get startled, my left arm would go numb for a couple minutes. I thought I was having miniature heart attacks, but wow. come to look, you know, Hindsight's 2020, I definitely think that those were just very minor flare-ups. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to go ahead. You can put them in the chat box or ask them now. If not, I do have more. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, as we wait for questions to come in, did you feel like when you were diagnosed or even when you have those moments where you're thinking this could be MS, did you have a resource or a community that you could reach out to? to learn more or connect with other people about this? Yeah, so even before I was diagnosed, I actually joined uh, the MS Society. Um, really? Partly because of my uncle and also partly because I just, WebMD is the worst thing in the world. So of course I was scared when I was having these minor things and I reached out to them and they, they were a great resource. They actually help a lot of people now who maybe can't afford their medication and things like that. Um, but they're, yeah, they're an awesome resource. That's great. And Lindsay says, thank you for sharing, Farah. Congrats on your son. He's so cute. Thanks, I can yeah. agree. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions for Farah? Okay. Farah, thank you so much for taking yes. the time. I, I know how busy you are. Oh, um, no. Hands are literally you. full. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. This is an awesome platform, and I'd love to talk about myself. So, this is <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the place to do it. <laughs> Farah? Um, Okay, so our next guest speaker, excuse me, is contemporary artist Lindsay Joy Holcomb. She's here with us now. She's from Portland, Oregon. She's an internationally recognized artist. She's been featured on Montel Williams' um, Free Thinking Podcast, <clears throat> Health Central, and Modern Day MS. I'm sorry, I have this tea. It's not handy. Um, so currently, Lindsay's work is actually on display at the Catherine Dean Gallery in Hillsboro, so you can check that out if you're in that area. She works with ink and thread to create these incredible translations of MRI scans. And she founded this project called Colors of MS. And this is a project, it comes in three parts, where she introduces the participant, talks about them as, you know, a person, and then talks about their MS story. So multiple sclerosis and how that affects them. And then she reveals her own piece. And it's, you've got to check out her work. We've got a source for her in our um, events page. She does just really incredible and intricate work with threading and details with ink. And she takes something that's, you know, it can be terrifying and worrisome to see or wait on MRI results. And she turns them into these beautiful, unique paintings that can really be appreciated you know, as, as, as your own, it's, it's a piece of yourself that she just makes so incredibly beautiful. So I've been following Lindsay's journey for a few years now, and I'm so honored to have her here with us today. So I'll let her uh, speak more on that. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. That was a really kind introduction. Um, 
I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm also a, I have two young daughters. I'm a mom, um, just surviving this quarantine period. I just moved to cage verbals out into the hallway. So pretty normal over here. Um, thank you for the introduction about the project. Um, I started it in 2019 on a total whim. Um, I kind of joke about it that it's, it's it's both the most wonderful thing that MS has given me, and it's also my longest coping mechanism to date. So um, I've learned a lot through every person that I work with. Um, I was diagnosed myself with RRMS in 2017, so I still consider myself fairly new to my own diagnosis. Um, it took me 10 years to get diagnosed. Um, and so by the time I did finally have test results and an actual diagnosis. I was probably one of the few that was happy about it because I'm like, okay, I was starting to feel a little nuts yeah. <laughs> for a few years. Definitely kind of like the girl who cried wolf and everyone's like, no, but your labs are fine. You know, it's this or that. Um, so I at least had a name to it in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, there's kind of a, a work up to the project itself. In 2018, um, I asked for reasonable accommodate, accommodations at work and was um, orged out the following week. <laughs> and, and so in one week, I found myself um, without a job after working for 15 years. Wow. Um, my grandmother passed away from a very long battle with Alzheimer's, which actually has influenced my work. Um, and I had an append my appendix out. And so that was a doozy of a week. And it's not a very good book or memoir title down the, down the road. It's like, lost my job, my grandma, and my appendix all in one week. <laughs> um, but that's really what made me um, sit back on my heels, whether I wanted to or not, and just kind of um, assess what I was doing. Um, I had up until then worked about, you know, the 50 to 60 hour work weeks for in corporate and consulting. Um, not a lot of joy there, just kind of running ragged all the time. And so suddenly my hobbies were able to take up my main part of my day. I've always been an artist, um, but it was always kind of relegated to 10 p.m. at night if I was lucky if my kids cooperated. And so uh, in 2019, I had my first MRI painting that I had done of my own MRI shared by the MS Society. Um, and I was really pleased and shocked that there seemed to be a lot of people that liked seeing MS represented through a different way. Um, and so I was reaching out to a bunch of people with like the worst icebreaker in the world. You know, if you don't know me, I'm like in your DM saying, hi, can I paint your like medically sensitive imagery? <laughs> Total stranger, would you give me your scans? <laughs> um, but you know, what started off as a trickle, I've done about, I just painted my 192nd MRI this last week. That's amazing. Um, Congrats. <laughs> Thank you, 64 of which are in the project. So I should say that the three part um, piece that you mentioned at the beginning is not for everyone, and I respect that. A lot of people just want painting to commemorate where they are in their journey and want to keep it off social media, are not ready to tell their story, no questions asked. You know, I just work with them to create their special piece, and sometimes they do want to share, and so that becomes part of the project that's public. That's amazing. Well, again, we've got tons of questions. Um, Nadine, you can go ahead or anyone else can jump in as well. Thanks, Rowan. I have two questions for you, Lindsay. First yeah. of all, thank you for being here. We can't thank you enough. <laughs> First question is, what ran through your mind to want to paint your MRI scan? I've never seen that out of anyone or any artist. That's question one. Question two is, how did you find um, the scans that you painted, you said, for example, you DMs people, how did you know that they had MS and that you could not? Um, yeah, that, that, those are great questions. I'd say that, 
you know, why I painted my own, um, this would have been in 2018, is I had finally seen some of my own scans where they were pointing out lesions in my brain, um, my brain scan, um, in my my chart kind of online chart thing. And I looked at it and nobody ever wants to see things in their brain. You know, I, I am not a very medical, curious person. I am just like, I don't want to know what's going on inside. I'm really, I'm a big weenie. So if you see, if I see blood, I faint. I mean, it's just a disaster. Um, so looking at things like that um, was really frightening to me and it felt very impersonal. Um, and I was having a hard time coming to terms with my diagnosis. I was still kind of in the information overwhelm stage where you know, even well-meaning people are sending me books and blogs and things and with the best of intentions, but when you're kind of like floored with information, that's not when I want to read a 600 page book on MS um, and completely rehaul my diet that I've been doing for 37 years. You know, with, at that time, my children were three and four. And so, you know, I was very much cooking whatever the heck they'd eat and eating it off the high chair or whatever. I mean, it just it was very daunting. It was, um, um, I was kind of feeling like I was failing by not just flipping a switch on all my lifestyle choices at the moment and, and fixing things right away. Um, and so I, I had taken this scan, I'm looking at it and I decided to paint it in color and colors that I liked and colors that made me happy. Um, and it was really just a very, um, it was a very uh, meditative moment and I felt a lot better afterwards. I actually have a copy of it here. Mm -hmm. The original is hanging up, but this was my first, this was my first scan that I based it off of. Wow. Um, and then this is a, this is actually a four foot tall painting mm -hmm. in real life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, double layered with threads and all sorts of things. So hard it's to show incredible. No, the texture uh, really shows through. It's beautiful. Right. Gorgeous. Um, thank you. Yeah. I felt a lot happier after looking at that than I did this. Yeah. Um, and that cha the style changes per person, whomever I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll have to remind me what the second part of your question was. Oh, yeah. No problem. Ramble. <laughs> Um, how did you find the people that you've now painted scans of? How did you connect with them? I literally reached out to people in the comment thread of the MS Society. So it was the first time I was like, ooh, I might have found my people. Because when I was first given um, my diagnosis in 2017, my doctor was kind of like, well, here's a Facebook group you could go to, here's this. And that was really my top resource at the time was reach out to your local MS Society chapter, which was great, but also kind of online communities. Um, and I'm not knocking them for people that do find comfort in those groups, but it was not for me. I found it terrifying because it was, um, I don't know what group it was that I joined initially, but it was kind of one of those things where everyone's like, my hair hurts. Is it MS? It <laughs> yeah. hurts. Is it MS? Yeah. Wait for me. I'm dying. I'm like, oh my God, like, I don't want to be here right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, all those things, we, we have all those thoughts and all those days, but I just, I kind of just wanted to look at it and process it in a different way. Um, and so that's kind of what inspired the heart of the project is, is showing people how different everybody's day to day is, how different everybody's approach to managing the disease is, how different um, all of our lifestyles are and our careers and directions that people have gone to. It doesn't look one way. So, um, yeah, that's a big part of it. That's great. I, I'm wondering when you and i don't know if you do if you go back for follow-up scans and to kind of see where you know are the lesions growing changing however that works how do you feel going into it now knowing that you can turn this into art Did i get really have... excited okay yeah that's... <laughs> so it's really it's, changed it's made me mind. happy <laughs> wow, it's made me geez. happy that i no longer i don't really dread those appointments anymore. And it's part of the humor of my care team though. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get your images right to you. Even my optometrist is like, look at this scan of your retina. Do you want it? And I'm like, 
Yes. <laughs> and I've heard that from people that I work with, which um, makes me so, so happy that maybe it's kind of changing the perspective of that day. Um, and I'd say that's my favorite thing about the project is the reveal. I always ask them, you know, do you want to be surprised by it? Do you want images ahead of time? Let me know. And it has become kind of like a almost like a holiday morning feel, which is really mm -hmm. special when you live with something that is phenomenally frustrating on those days. So that's yeah, amazing. those have become happy days. <laughs> that's so great because I know I've got my fair share of, you know, hospital visits or, or scans. And for me, it's always terrifying. So I'm wondering, I like that approach of turn this into something that you can be excited about versus being mm -hmm. so horrified by. Yes. Um, <laughs> and another question I've noticed that you work with ink and thread. Um, I've got this is a two part question as well. <laughs> so the first part is how did you make the connection to put thread into your work? It adds a very beautiful layer. And when you do uh, the threading technique, I know Ferris talked before about, you know, her fingers hurting um, when, you know, she's having to button something. Does that affect you as well having a mess with the threading process? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. It's very hard. I don't think it's a forever thing for me. It's something I can do right now, and I'm happy for that. Um, I, you know, by both embroidering my pieces and um, I add a fine dot detail to a lot of things, which I just really like doing. That drives me insane. Some days I can do it in one day. Some days a piece will take me two, three weeks, depending on how my symptoms are. Um, that is sheer stubbornness on my end. <laughs> so, and I use I use a big like welder's magnifying hat thing that is really the least attractive thing on earth that helps me like get up close to things. Um, so I'm not straining as much. But um, you know, my top symptoms that I deal with on a daily basis almost are my optic neuritis. So I'll see double or confetti in my eyes or I have tremors in my hands and so none of it actually makes sense and that I think shows my personality more than anything else so I'm like well I'm gonna do it until I can't do it and then I'll switch styles like, like we'll figure it out yeah that's um, great it's definitely working for you right now well thank you the yeah. red um, ties into kind of my grandmother's story a little bit. I mentioned earlier, um, she passed in 2018 after a very long fight with, um, with Alzheimer's. And that was a difficult process. Um, she's the relative I grew up closest with. Uh, she was a costumer. Um, and so she was always going some sort of fantastic thing growing up. Um, her table was always piled with all these crazy fabrics. And so when she passed, um, I, the only thing that I could think that I wanted to remember her by was her sewing kit. And so I inherited all of her threads, which was a lot, a, a lot of schools. Um, and as kind of a cheeky granddaughter moment, I put her thread on all of my paintings because she was always very, very insistent. She says, I'm not an artist. Like, stop it. No, I, what I do is not art. Like, it's no big deal. And so I, she's now on all of my art pieces all over the world. And so I think she'd, she'd get a kick out of that. So that's a lot of the reason why I do it. Um, as I was sitting with her in like the final months um, in, when she was in palliative care, I I passed the time mostly by just talking to her and doing French knots over and over again. So that's kind of something I remember from my last few um, times with her. So it's important. It's an important that's, element in my pieces. That's very beautiful. Really incredible. Um, we do have some questions from people in the chat. Um, John Doe asks, were you an artist before your diagnosis? I was, yes. Um, a hobby, a hobby artist. I'd say I had done a couple shows. I'd always painted in acrylic and oil. Um, and I had kind of a love-hate relationship with it. I loved doing, I, I always wanted to do portraits. I've always been drawn to doing portraiture. And in oil, it's so fiddly 
And so I would find myself being frustrated every time I sat down, like, oh, here we are again. Like, that still looks weird. Like, you know, and I have a house full of children and dogs and gerbils. And if you work in oil, I mean, they take months and months to yeah, dry. dry. So just, all of it was impractical. Um, and so the reason I chose ink to work with is because, one, I ordered it by mistake. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> And I tried it and it was so relaxing. Like it's very hard to not have ink turn out nice looking. I mean, I, it's just, it's a meditative medium. It has a mind of its own. You can control as much as you can try. You can try. <laughs> you can think you can do it. I think I can do it on some things, but it will surprise me every time, which is good for me to not <laughs> have to think about. Yeah. Um, and it's easier on the hands, too, I believe, using alcohol inks and things like that instead of, um, you know, brush and being so precise. And we've got a I couple will say more. I, I'm concerned about it in the long run because it's really kind of toxic stuff to work with. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to work with full ventilation and, a, you know, I was COVID ready before COVID with all yeah. of this. And, uh, <laughs> you Very know, good disclaimer. Yes, <laughs> I'm like, of course, I have like excess. Um, John Doe asks again, whose art is behind you? Oh, this is all my art. This is this is my my messy studio. So um, these you can't see that well. I, I could take you on a Blair Witch tour closer. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's uh, these are like the first fifty wow. pieces that I did. Um, Beautiful. Very see, nice. Some, some of that threading. And they each tell a different story, it looks like. They do, yeah. It's important to me that, um, you know, a lot of the questions I ask in the beginning is, you know, what colors bring you joy? Which things, you know, would you absolutely want to avoid? Um, and if they have any sort of inspiration design-wise that makes them happy. I've had, you know, people send me ocean palettes saying, you know, this is my happy place. Or I've had people send me boards with Alexander McQueen stuff all over. Wow. I'm like, okay. Got it. <laughs> and, you know, I've had some challenges, but um, it's really important to me that each piece is is um, works for whomever it's going home to. Yeah. So. And we've got time for another question. Aliana says, beautiful work. Do you paint any other medical imagery besides brain MRIs? Great you know, uh, that's a great question. I haven't. Um, I've done, you know, several different kinds of scans that are not in the project for people that have wanted them. Um, I'm about to start a big project on Lyme disease. I wow. swear this is not my only focus. I do paint other things, but yeah, it works. Um, yeah it's, it's always something that's on my mind. So I, I would be interested if you had any thoughts. Sure. That's great. And and there's definitely ways to connect with Lindsay um, through our website on our events page. Her link, it, her website is linked to that. So if you'd like to talk more with her, you definitely can. Um, and maybe we've got time for one more. Um, Van Gogh's Starry Night was said to be his view from the window when he was in a mental asylum. Do you have any pieces that portray best your struggle? Um, I don't know how to photograph it. <laughs> I will say, I have spent the entire pandemic painting a white painting that um, that is just something that I've come back to over and over again over the year. And I've always these these are the types of paintings I, I'm going to betray my art knowledge here. But you know, when you're standing in a contemporary museum, I'm like, oh, it's just gray. <laughs> like we can do that, you know, like. I have had those thoughts, I admit to them, but now that I've spent an entire year being like, this painting means so much to me and it's just white. <laughs> um, is, so I'd say that would, would show it best besides my very first MRI that I painted. Um, thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah, that was really great. Thanks, John Doe. Yes, really great questions, good conversations. Um, I'm sorry, the other question about whose art is behind you is from Jibbler Gems, just so that we, we know that. Um, yeah, so if anyone doesn't have any other questions, um, again, you can find Lindsay's information on our website. Lindsay, thank you so much for being here today. It means so much to us and to our audience.
I'm loving this brain art happening. So thank you oh, for good. having me. Oh, good. Great. And Alicia, very nice job. That's beautiful. I know. I know. I've been staring at that. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I hate it so much. I had a different image in my mind. And yeah, it's working. But it was fun at least. <laughs> good. That's the point. Um, if there's no more questions, I'll jump to our next guest. Um, I'll just give it a second. Doesn't look like there's any more. So I'll jump to our next guest, um, Linnea Cruz. I'm not sure where you are in all of these screens I see, but our <laughs> next guest is Linnea Cruz. She's been in the medical industry. Hey, Linnea. Hi. She's been in the medical field for over 10 years. She's been a registered nurse for over 10 years as well. She's treated patients who are elderly, who are mentally ill, who come in from emergency rooms, and who have brain conditions. Um, Linnea has taught me so much over the years with her professional experience. Um, and aside from that, Linnea, 15 years ago, taught me how to make the best Subway sandwich when we worked together for three years. I'm sure we've got plenty to talk about there. But, uh, thank you, Linnea, so much for being with us. I know this is your off time and you're supposed to be sleeping, so we appreciate you. Um, Linnea will be talking about her experience treating patients with brain conditions, particularly stroke patients. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm like half asleep. But anyway, um, so I just wanted to come in here really quick and say, you know, not a lot of people are in the medical field. And I feel like there's not a lot of people that um, know much about strokes. Um, when you first, I feel like when somebody in the family first has a stroke, nobody really knows what it is. Like nobody really knows what the signs and symptoms are. Um, and I work a lot with paramedics and they always use, um, not always use, they use, uh, always use something called a Cincinnati scale, but that's besides the point. Um, for people out in the community, we always try to teach them something called BFAS, it's a mnemonic, uh, B-E-F-A-S-T. Um, the B and B fast is for balance. So this is like, this mnemonic is really helpful if you are not in the medical field and you think someone's having a stroke, but you're not really sure. Um, and the B stands for balance. So if you're out having a good time with your family or just out in the community, and you see somebody kind of off their balance, not kind of off their balance, but they can't stand and they're saying that they're so dizzy they can't stand, um, please go and help, you know, anybody who's obviously not at their baseline. Um, but somebody who can't stand loses their balance like that and can't stand back up, there is definitely something wrong with them. Um, the E in B fast is for eyes. So if at any second somebody, you're having a conversation with them and they say, I all of a sudden can't see in one eye or both eyes. That's also another symptom of a stroke. Um, the F in that is face. So a lot of times you'll see um, even people who have suffered a stroke in the past with kind of what we call unilateral um, weakness to a face. So you'll have one face that's drooped like either one side or um, maybe a mouth. Like if you ask them to give you a big smile, one side of their face is it really giving that smile. One of them's like smiling and the other one's just like relaxed. Um, and then the A in B fast is for arms. So if you ask them to hold up their arm, they can't hold one up or they can't hold it up as high or as long as the other arm. That is also a symptom. Um, same with the legs. If they say they have numbness to their arm, that's um, definitely a big warning sign. Um, the S in there is speech. So just because someone has large speech doesn't necessarily mean they're having a stroke. They could also be very drunk um, or have some other symptoms going on. But if they have slurred speech or if they are talking and then they are like word substituting, like they're, they can't say dog, and all of a sudden that's like a new thing, like they're trying, they're looking at it, they're calling it something else. That is, that is definitely a symptom of a stroke that's called um, dysphagia. Um, and then T is very important. It's, it stands for time. And we always say time is brain. 
because the moment someone has a stroke, it's like a ticking time for medical professionals to help them. So um, the sooner that you catch it, the better it is uh, outcome for them. Um, I'm not an artist. I don't know who just asked that. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so T is for time. Um, a lot of people, I want to say, will wait a few hours and see if their symptoms go away. Please do not do not do that. Um, it is better to treat it early than to treat it later. Um, and then also it's uh, time means a lot of things for us. So um, the second that these symptoms start, the we, we would like to know because that that is like a time frame for most treatments that we give at, in the hospital. So, um, oh man, I just went on a whole ramble with just the be fast thing, but that was very um, helpful. <laughs> Um, but that is, uh, like, to people who aren't in the medical profession, that's the first thing we want to teach people. It's just signs and symptoms of a stroke. That way we can help a loved one, God forbid, if they ever have a stroke, um, get them to the hospital fast. And I suggest do not, do not drive them to the hospital, but call 911 instead. Uh, there are uh, specialty hospitals of stroke, so you don't want to rush them to the wrong hospital um, because all that hospital is going to do is rush them to a different hospital <laughs> that can stroke. Uh, teach, uh, not teach, I'm sorry, treat stroke patients. Um, but there's that, there's the BFAS thing that you will probably see or hear or see posters of, um, especially in like, uh, what's it called, TV or if you're in the hospital, they have that everywhere. We, we've got a question. I don't know if we can see it, Linnea. I can. It's really fast, so it like comes up and then it just comes back down and I don't know how to re read it. Oh, we can. Okay. Can't a minor stroke rewire your brain, so to speak, and actually make a person more creative? I have not heard it in those terms. Um, a minor stroke is also, it's a TIA, we call it TIA, it's a transient ischemic attack. And most. I have never actually heard it being called like or referred to as rewiring a brain. What it actually is is um, like a like a warning stroke, I guess you could say, to a bigger stroke, which is never a good thing. Um, but I do kind of understand where you're going with that. You're thinking, you know, if one artery in a brain gets clogged off, does the rest of your artery kind of like a tree off into other parts of the brain and unfortunately that as from what I hear does not happen so um, it might make your personality different I guess if that's what you're thinking of it, it, it could bring up old memories if that's what you're thinking of but we do necessarily and usually don't like to see warning strokes because it, it's usually a sign of an impending huge stroke so I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, and, and some of that is talked about, too, in this book from earlier, Essentials of the Brain. It talks about strokes and kind of explains it the way that um, Linnea did, where it's very easy to understand and clear. Um, and it talks about, you know, why why we do or say certain things, too. So if you're interested in that, John Doe, that's um, it's called Essentials of the Brain. And we've written in the chat um, the BFAS and what they stand for. So that was really great. Thank you for that. That's really good yeah. to know. And Linnea, just one more question, unless someone else has more questions in the chat. Um, if you could tell us maybe a, a story that was successful with a stroke patient and an unsuccessful story, um, if, if you could share that. Yeah, there's actually a lot of <laughs> stroke stories i feel like every night we have a, a like a, a code stroke we call it but um usually so i work in the emergency department honest to god i, I see so many people that i don't really follow up with you know how they're doing after and it's i mean there's a whole law about you know not reaching out to your past patients but um one of them it was crazy so i work at a very small community hospital and then I also work at a bigger hospital, which has um, multiple specialties, and one of them is a stroke. Um, so I, at, when I was working at my smaller hospital, um, a code stroke came in. He couldn't say his name, and he was definitely having all the symptoms. You know, he couldn't speak. 
he, his one uh, side of his face was definitely drooped and he had the whole arm, he couldn't lift it up thing. And as I'm talking or trying to communicate with this man, um, he's giving me his ID. And it happened to be my friend's father-in-law. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. And I'm like, oh man, you look so, like, no wonder you look so familiar. But we, as we treat every patient, you know, doesn't matter if you're family or if you're a stranger, we treat you the same. We try to give you the best kind of care. Um, but we got him to the CAT scanner um, and treated him with something called TPA, um, which is a medication that goes through your, your IV. Um, and we, it was, I, I mean, like I said, I never see my patients after we treat them. We usually just, you know, ship them to the ICU or med surge or whatnot. But, um, and I never told anybody else that he was my patient, but um, we ended up treating him. He went to the ICU and then a few weeks later, I'm seeing videos of him and he does still have a little bit of weakness, but he can walk. He's like talking and it was just amazing. Um, his smile is, even though it's, you know, it's unilateral, it, he does have that little droop. It's still like really nice to see someone smile, especially since, you know, sometimes when we do have these stroke patients and they're out of the window, we call it, or out of the time window, um, they don't make it or they don't improve at all. So it was really nice to me to see him like walking around and, um, not nice to see him drinking after a stroke, but he was... <laughs> But he was having a good time, so I guess that's good. Um, um, so that was, he was definitely one of my um, favorite cases, if I could say I had one. Um, and we, we have so many, um, we have so many stroke patients, uh, some unsuccessful, oh, some unsuccessful ones I might not want to mention on here, but... Um, I do also remember this patient who also had a stroke and it was kind of sad because he, I think he stroked out in his sleep and nobody knew. Um, so when they tried to wake him up the next morning, he like was a totally different person and couldn't talk or uh, like communicate or even move. Um, but that's, you know, that, that happens sometimes and it's really sad because Time is brain, and if you're sleeping through a stroke and nobody's around, you know, it's it's kind of hard to catch. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks, Linnea. Thanks, Thanks so much so for sharing sure. with us. And I hope um, everyone can take this information and also be more mindful of how we can help our community members if we see these symptoms or um, come across our elders who, who might have these. Um, I was telling everyone in the beginning my grandma had Alzheimer's and it was a, a bad battle with it. She also had a stroke. Um, mm -hmm. She had a lot. So just seeing what she was able to do in her life up until a certain point and seeing her drop off after um, hurt a lot. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this. If we can prevent things from getting worse, we certainly want to. And with that, if no one has any other questions, I just have some closing remarks and then I'll pass it to Rowan as well. Um, I can't thank all of you enough for taking the time out of your Saturday and spending it with us. I hope that you've learned a lot about perspective, how art can also influence um, science and how science influences art. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a blog post on our website if you go to Blog Talks. It talks about five tips on how to improve brain power and health. Just to name two of them, you guys can read the rest of them online, is the first one, you really want to use your brain actively. And what I mean by that is, you know, times have changed and we're kind of wasting our time. Not wasting, but a lot of our time is spent just sort of scrolling through images. Rather than doing that, for example, Lindsay's take on everything is painting. The more we work on, on things paint or puzzles, or I know Mateo really likes chats, which is a great one to improve brain power. That's what we want to do. Because ultimately, if it helps us down the line, that's what we want as a healthier society overall. Second one is um, food, like everyone was saying, like they talked about at the beginning, food and uh, what not to put in your diet. So 
Turmeric is a great one to put. You can get it, and I forgot to pull it out of my spice cabinet, but you can get it anywhere, you know, a few bucks at the grocery store. You can put it out of the spice in your foods. It's been known to decrease depression, um, help your overall mood and brain stimulation. It's also found in a root form or gummies, which might taste better, but I really like the taste. Another one is alcohol. Um, it's, it's really not good for you. So when you experience a hangover, um, what the hangover is doing chemistry-wise is altering your brain chemistry. Studies have also shown that increased hangovers will shrink the size of your brain. And so I thought of an alternative, which is maybe boring to some people, but I just put like ginger and cucumber water, a couple of ice cubes, a mint leaf, and it looks like a drink, but it's really not. I mean, that's a great way, especially if you've got work the next day, you can have an event the night before to keep yourself healthy and still participate in whatever you want. Um, with that said, check out our blogs and post your ideas if you have any. I'd love to hear them. And we also have a, a shop that displays art, merchandise, clothes, accessories very beautifully. So check out. We'd love for you guys to shop and uh, spread awareness and, and wear our merch. And uh, if you don't want to do any of that, you can donate. There's a, a donate tab for you as well. Next month, we have an event on July 17th for one, if you want to share a little bit about that. Yeah, and actually, right before I do that, we have a raised hand. I think Rescued Soul, you wanted to speak in? Yes, I just had a question. Um, thanks for having this, by the way. It's been very interesting and educational Thank for you. me. Um, I am wondering, has anyone here used any type of sound healing therapy, uh, brain frequencies, right frequencies, anything like that? I have, and then Lindsay, I see you shaking your head a little bit. Mine is just, um, someone was kind enough to buy me um, a machine from Amazon, where at night it's a white fan noise, and that helped me meditate and sleep a lot better than when I've never used it. It was really difficult for me to sleep. So that's helped me and then Lindsay, I don't know if you have something to share today. Um, I've done a lot of sound healing and I also listen to, like you, even on Spotify, you can find stations healing frequencies and things like that. And that's actually what I paint too. Oh, wow. So it's mm -hmm. just relaxing. <laughs> Thank you. Has anyone um, tried any sound healing with the bone conduction headphones? Um, I have like some hearing loss and some other symptoms and I tried bone conduction headphones for the first time this week and I could feel it um, all in my face and throughout my head. I was just wondering if anyone else has had an experience with that. That is so interesting and, and Rescue Soul, I'd love if you could um, you know, mention that in our event recap later on this week in our blog, if you could talk about that, maybe okay. you can uh, provide a link for our audience. We can definitely share that with them. If that's okay, great. For you. I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. That's, yeah, great questions too. And Rescued Soul, we're, we're going to be doing events on hearing loss as well. So we'd love to reconnect with you. Uh, okay. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and next, next month actually is going to be about vision. So we'll be talking about um, healthy vision awareness and artists like Monet. And then we'll also bring in a contemporary artist. And again, um, check out the blog post that Nadine has up right now. It's got great tips for, you know, how to prevent headaches and keep our brain power healthy. And uh, we'll keep in contact soon about the event recap so we can all connect and share our tips on there as well. And thank you all so much for being here. This was really great and very informative from everybody. Thank you thank so you much. Everyone. Thank, thank you. Have a great month. day. Thanks again. Bye.